Okay, we're good. Okay, here we go. So we're going to begin the uh, first uh, session of the afternoon. And in case you are expecting Jerry Schnoor, I'm, I'm sorry, you don't get Jerry. Jerry had a little airplane mishap, and he will be here eventually, but not now. So I'm Bruce Rittman, and I'm substituting for Jerry Schnoor as the moderator. I'm the director of the Sweetie Center for Environmental Biotechnology at Arizona State uh, University. And that's enough about me for the moment, because the important person is our speaker, who is Dr. Nancy Rebele. Uh First of all, she is the winner of the 2008 Clark Prize. So that's really a good thing. Yay, Nancy. And her day job is as the executive director and professor at the Louisiana University's Marine Consortium, and where she's, she's a marine ecologist, and her research includes strategies to document and mitigate the effects of hypoxic zones, that is the uh, aquatic areas with low dissolved oxygen, known as dead zones sometimes, and uh, her work besides research includes trying to influence management po policy, such as by testifying before Congress and working with federal, state, and tribal agencies on action plans. And finally, our highlight, maybe, is that in 2012, she won a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. And with that, Nancy. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back here. Um, uh, and I don't know if you noticed the picture, I'm not bald yet, from 2008, although I do have a few more gray hairs than I did back then. And I have a little more metal in my back right now than I did back then too. But anyway, um, for those of you, I'm, I'm going to make you look at this slide for a long time because I'd like people to see it because this is really what I'm talking about. Water is everything to us. We only have a, a set amount. We need to take care of it. And we need to um, impress upon others the need for good water throughout the world and the need for all of us to foster that resource that we have. And it's also going to be a story about connections. We've heard many connections today, um, things that go around and come around and um, different projects that lead into other projects that feed back into other projects. The idea today for me with the connectedness is just the water itself and how it holds us all together and supports our society and um, allows us to have quality of life. I don't need to tell you the water cycle. It's a fixed cycle. We only have so much. Um, everybody knows about evaporation and precipitation and evapotranspiration from the ocean. I'm also going to take us more into the salt end on this talk because my work in the Mississippi River watershed in the Gulf of Mexico has to do with what happens on the landscape affects the coastal ocean. Probably most of you worry about salinity with saltwater intrusion into drinking waters or desalinization plants in areas where there's not enough fresh water. <clears throat> but I'm sort of taking this on the other end. What happens in the fresh water affects the coastal ocean. About two-thirds of the water that falls on the Mississippi River watershed comes from the Gulf of Mexico. So that's one of our connections. But you can also see that the rivers in the Mississippi River watershed contribute a huge amount of water to the Gulf of Mexico and has major consequences, consequences on its physics, its geology, its biogeochemistry, and its biology. <clears throat> it's one of the world's top 10 rivers with regard to size, length, and volume of water and sediment delivered to the coastal ocean. So it's, it's a major river. And it's having major um, <clears throat> effects on the adjacent Gulf of Mexico. The watershed's large. It covers about, um, <clears throat> you think, which one of these numbers? About 30, let me see. There's 31 states. It covers about 40% uh, of the lower 48 contiguous states. 
and it drains into the Gulf of Mexico uh, south of the city of New Orleans and also a diverged part of the river through uh, the Atchafalaya into the coast. And the red area at the bottom of the map is the area of low oxygen, oxygen deficiency, and very often called a dead zone, uh, which I try not to call it too often, except it does ring a bell when you're in Congress. Uh, Secretary Kerry at the State of the uh, Ocean Conference this year, this Ju June in uh, Washington, D.C., talked about dead zones at least four times during his many presentations. And uh, <clears throat> I still didn't get to shake his hand. I kept saying, dead zone, dead zone. But <laughs> uh, he was too busy, too busy. So closer down into the river, you can see what it looks like uh, from a satellite image that shows mostly the sediment delivery into the upper uh, part of the Gulf of Mexico. The Birdfoot Delta here south of New Orleans, a third of the water is delivered uh, into the Atchafalaya River to join with the Red River, and it uh, comes into the Gulf more in the central Louisiana coastal zone. The winds are predominantly from the southeast, so that carries most of the sediment, the dissolved nutrients, particulate, dissolved carbon, all the uh, particulates and dissolved things that come with a river affect the continental shelf to the west of the river primarily. <clears throat> There's a reversal in the summer of the currents and some of it gets to the east. It responds to, of course, river discharge and nutrient loads. Most of the water comes in uh, March, April. Most of, the, most of the nutrients come in April, May. And then we have mixing events in the fall that disrupt it and then it starts the cycle over again the next February or March. Hypoxia 101, we saw, what was it, um, water management 4.0 this morning. Uh, this is hypoxia 101. Fresh water and nutrients are delivered into the Gulf of Mexico, which is saltier, of course. Uh, there's a buoyancy plume, uh, and that buoyancy plume gets warmed in the summer, so you have a very strong stratification between the surface waters and the bottom waters, which are cooler and more salty. Nutrients fuel the primary productivity, which is huge, and which is why we have such productive fisheries in the northern Gulf of Mexico, but we just get too much. It's not taken up by the food web. A lot of senescent dead phytoplankton cells reach the bottom, and a lot of that carbon is recycled through uh, zooplankton fecal pellets. <clears throat> then there's respiration of this organic carbon in the bottom, the uptake of oxygen and it can't be resupplied across that picnic line. So we end up with large areas of low oxygen throughout the uh, summer, early spring through summer. Our operational definition is two milligrams per liter. It might be five milligrams per liter in Long Island Sound, three in Chesapeake Bay, but ours is two because if a trawler puts a net over the side and the oxygen's below two, it doesn't catch anything. Uh, no shrimp, no demersal fin fish, those that depend on the bottom, which can have uh, <clears throat> major consequences to fisheries, both recreational and commercial, over an area up to 22,000 square kilometers in the summer. Um, and as I like to tell Christine Todd Whitman, the ex-governor of New Jersey, we keep equating it to the size of the state of New Jersey. There are several consequences. We do get fish kills. They're not a major issue. We have had decline in the brown shrimp catch over several decades. Organisms start to come up out of the sediments and uh, trying to reach for um, oxygen. You can see all of this organic matter on the surface of the sediments. Some of them, I mean, there's also, this is also evidence that the fish aren't coming into the area. They can flee and escape. But the fact that this, these really juicy, good things to eat, polychaetes, um, are not being preyed upon means that the fish aren't being able to use a huge area of the habitat. Some things will die, um, and then they de de decompose, and you can see uh, bacteria around them and anoxic black sediments, and sometimes just uh, extensive mats of sulfur oxidizing bacteria. I've been doing this for 30 years. I was a very young child when I started <laughs> going to sea in the Gulf of Mexico. I was a prodigy. 
<laughs> but we do a cruise once a summer that covers all of these stations and more. We have Transex C, it, which is off of Terrebonne Bay, which is where my lab is located, about right here. We've picked up other transects off the Atchafalaya, so we have a natural ecosystem comparison between the effects of the Mississippi and one-third of the effects of the Mississippi in a different receiving environment. So we've been doing this for a while. Unfortunately, our funding is coming to a halt, um, but we've been doing this for a while. So this is the map from 2011. It was a, a year when the Mississippi River was in flood. Oh, don't, don't take the ocean away from me. No, no, no. <laughs> um, and you can see that um, it's from very near shore to further offshore from um, as close as I can get the research vessel, the Pelican, to go into inshore, which is about four meters, and then they get very nervous, out to about 50, 60 meters depth offshore from very close to the shore to uh, up to 100 kilometers offshore. And again, it's mostly prevalent in the spring, but very widespread, severe, and persistent in the summer. <clears throat> it's related to the discharge. As I mentioned, 2011 was a flood year, even went over the long-term maximum. And then 2012 was a drought year. So you expect less precipitation, uh, less load, less nutrients uh, com compared to less precipitation, less discharge, less nutrients. Um, but it's not just the um, <clears throat> amount of water that drives the conditions because the conditions have been changing over the last 50 years. Um, as with everywhere else in the world, the Mississippi River watershed is increasing in human population. The amount of legumes that are being planted <clears throat> the, um, and the amount of fertilizer that's being applied to this land and the amount of uh, NOx emissions from fossil fuel burning. In the Mississippi River watershed, the Gulf of Mexico, most of the east coast of the U.S., most of Europe, these symptoms of over enrichment such as harmful algal blooms and dead zones around the world, that's when they started to appear. In the developing countries around the world is where it's, it's starting to happen now. It's about a 20-year lag and you start to see the same things happening uh, off the Chongjiang, the Wanghe, uh, a lot of the rivers in South America where they didn't have these problems before, having them now. <clears throat> the reason is human beings and our industrialization activities and our artificial fertilizers that have been added over the years. And you can see the difference in what's called the reactive nitrogen now as compared to the past. And there's also about a three times increase in the amount of phosphorus that is uh, moved off the watershed and from the rivers now into the coastal ocean than compared to the pre-industrial times. These are the dots around the coastal ocean where low oxygen occurs. It has expanded exponentially. These are reports from the literature. And it's not just that people have been publishing more there actually are more and more and more. Um, I question the last 50 because they all, well, I don't question it. They, they just like to count. Because um, in this area, there are a whole lot of these dots that, you know, I ask them, how, how far apart were you from the last station where you found hypoxia? But it's definitely a degraded system. And the second largest in the world is in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, which receives the input from the breadbasket of America. The largest is the Baltic Sea. <clears throat> um, it's not only in the Gulf of Mexico, it's around the whole U.S. The red dots show where there are symptoms of eutrophication, in, including low oxygen areas. Green, there has been some improvement, and yellow, we just don't, um, I'm sorry, where there are none, and um, the yellow is where we're concerned. I gave a talk in South America in November 1999 here and at that time I was talking about the Mississippi River and the changes in the coastal ocean they said oh our rivers are much too large to ever have this kind of problem and now look at the number of dots on that on that map so it's happening everywhere the issue in the Mississippi River watershed is non-point source pollution 
Um, there are some municipal inputs, some point uh, inputs, but those are only about 10% of the overall input of both nitrogen and phosphorus into the system. If you're in Long Island Sound, it's mostly urban and urban runoff. If you're in Chesapeake Bay, it's uh, a combination of fertilizer, agriculture, NOx emissions, and uh, urban development. So depending on where you are, the relative proportion is uh, of the uh, sorts of inputs is very different. But you can see that in the Mississippi watershed, most of the nitrogen comes from corn, soybean rotations, uh, other crops. Uh, this is the atmospheric and also with the phosphorus, a lot of it uh, also from agriculture or uh, animal confinement. And you can also see where a lot of this occurs in the watershed, uh, mostly in the upper part of the watershed and uh, definitely um, in the Corn Belt. And a very highly productive part of the Mississippi uh, called the Delta, rich farming areas. So since the 1950s, uh, most of the inputs to the system have been about the same. But the one that's changed the most is the dramatic increase in the use of artificial fertilizers uh, over this time period. And our sediment cores from offshore paleo indicators indicate that we started seeing the effects in the early 70s and it's gotten worse over time because we don't have oxygen data that go back that far. So we've increased the nitrogen by 300% and we've increased the phosphorus by 300%. This is very important for crops, uh, growing crops that provide food for us and others. Um, also feeds livestock, hogs, chickens, uh, cattle. Um, and my favorite combination of corn and beef is, uh, of course, a taco. But you can't ignore the big elephant in the room, which is the ethanol, which is being grown uh, more and more to support energy needs. And um, because of that, more cropland, more, fer more fertilizer, and an increase in the nutrient loads to the Gulf. The, um, this increase uh, in nitrogen has been mostly due to concentration and not the change in the discharge of the river, except now it's kind of parallel, it's kind of flattened out, so river discharge is much more important now than it was historically. But if you went back in time, the, nit the nitrate would have been back here. So it's mostly a nitrogen-driven system, uh, but it also is affected by phosphorus as well. And from our experiments, we find that um, phytoplankton growth is mostly controlled by nitrogen and phosphorus, whereas in many freshwater systems, it seems to be a phosphorus limitation. And in true marine systems, it's mostly a nitrogen-only uh, limitation. And this amount of nitrogen that comes in the spring in May is a direct correlate with the size of the low oxygen in the summer in July, which is when we do our mapping of the whole area. It's a very strong predictor, about 81% of the variability. Phosphorus is important, discharge is important, but the single most important factor is uh, the nitrate concentration. As I mentioned, when I was 15 years old in 1985, we took our first cruise. Um, and we didn't find much low oxygen. Uh, ND usually stands for no data, but in this case it's no dollars because we didn't have enough money to map the whole area. We had a very small area in 1988, severe drought, and then variability over the years because of the amount of nitrogen load. And then when we were out here on our 30th anniversary cruise, uh, we had um, maybe not the uh, all-time high or near the long-term average, but certainly well above the goal, which is to get it back to 5,000 square kilometers. So we know more nutrients, more phytoplankton, more biomass gets to the bottom, there's more oxygen consumed, more hypoxia, and we know this also from our paleo indicators and cores that go back to the early 1800s. The other thing that's happened in the system is there's a regime shift. It takes less nitrogen now to produce the same amount of low oxygen than it did historically. No, it takes more. Oh, wait, wait a minute. The, ugh, I always have trouble with this. The size of the low oxygen now is larger than it used to be 
for less nitrogen put into the river. So the efforts to control and to try to do something about it are even more difficult to achieve now than they were uh, when it was not as large. Like I said, this was our 50th anniversary. Our uh, O2, low O2 emblem uh, was put into a t-shirt design. Oh no, Lodeo. Um, the back side is just as interesting. It says 30 years and still. So we're 30 years into this. Uh, in 2001, we had a goal of 5,000 square kilometers to bring it back down to size over a five-year running average, and basically not much has been done to achieve that goal. Um, it's non-point. It's not regulated. It depends on volunteer, volunteer uh, and incentives. Oh yeah, and we got a we got a 30th anniversary cake too, and I got to the, blow out all the candles, but it was towards the end of the cruise and I was tired, so I didn't get them all out. 30 is a lot. We know we can do something. Agricultural practices, best management. We um, have the ability to make differences in wetlands and and wastewater treatment. Uh, but the biggest bang for the buck is going to come through agricultural uh, mitigation. Now, one thing that we as individuals can do is if we have a different kind of a diet, this is all going to get back to the carbon footprint of us human beings. If we had um, the same sort of diet into the future, you can see how much more fertilizer is going to be required versus if we had something more like a Mediterranean diet um, that didn't have a lot of meat and had wheat base for uh, things like noodles, uh, we might be better off. So the message here is <laughs> eat more fish. But then again, some of the fish might be contaminated or they might be uh, non-sustainable fisheries. So you can always eat more pasta. This is a personal decision along with driving a fuel efficient car and not contributing to the carbon footprint, which drives a lot of the problems in, in, in watersheds and in the coastal ocean. <clears throat> we all, I hope, had to endure this nitrogen cycle somewhere in our education. And you can see all the different forms of nitrogen and what happens in aerobic and anaerobic conditions. And there's not even animox and dissimilatory something on this slide. But this is a different kind of a nit nitrogen cycle. This is a nitrogen molecule with dollar signs on each side, and they're called nitrollers. And these nitrollers, like the water that starts in the Gulf of Mexico and then rains down on the upper part of the watershed, um, nitrollers are formed mostly through artificial fertilizer generation with cheap natural gas in the lower Mississippi River corridor primarily and moves up the river in the form of anhydrous ammonium. Uh, more urea is being produced right now. Um, and these, nitro these nitrollers get into the corn, they get into the hogs, they get into hogs all over the place. There's local water quality problems because of that. A lot of the nitrollers are now getting into ethanol uh, you can see nitrollers coming from Congress to subsidize agricultural practices in the Midwest rather than conservation practices. Um, and uh, you don't see any nitrollers coming from Congress to support the fisheries in the Gulf of Mexico, which is a $2.8 billion enterprise compared to a $98 billion for, for the ag economy. But these economies are important to both of these sectors of society. Phosphorus, likewise, is mined in Florida, brought to Louisiana, made into fertilizer, goes up into the watershed, comes back down, fuels the cycle. So everything is connected, and it's also connected with a global economy. So the future holds for us, in addition, some climate change, which at least in the Mississippi and many other places is going to aggravate. Nutrient loads are getting more and more to the ocean increased population, biofuels, atmospheric deposition, it's all going to come uh, back around to us. And I'm going to skip this one because it's, um, it's a little complicated. So let me end with this connection here, my water connection. Um, 
We have oxygen meters in the Gulf of Mexico attached to offshore oil platforms. This is me, and this is me with my bottle in the bag, getting ready to jump in, and we, we test the water next to the meters to make sure that um, it's reading the same as the meters. Uh, every summer, I collect a sample of water from the bottom in the low oxygen area. So it's less than two, sometimes it's uh, sometimes sulfitic. I bring that water to my Unitarian church in Baton Rouge where we have a water ceremony every fall. And you bring water from places far away, places close to home, places from a vacation that has some meaning to you as an individual. And, I, and we saved the water from the previous year and we put the water from our collections into the urn for the year of concern. And uh, other than last year, when I had a little back complication, um, I bring water from the dead zone, I pour it into the urn, and I re-confirm um, my desire to see better water quality, uh, not only locally in Baton Rouge and in the U.S., uh, but globally as well. And that's my connection to water, and I think water's connection to all of us. And I'm just uh, glad that I was at one time honored with the Clark Award and that I'm here today to uh, share this connection with you. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for a couple questions, I think. So uh, we have a microphone somewhere. Okay, over there. Where's the microphone? It's coming, it's coming. I see it. Okay. Nancy, thank you for a wonderful talk. I, I wonder if you could tell me, is there a relationship between these um, hypoxia issues you're describing and harmful algal blooms? Absolutely. Uh, the excess nutrients and the shifts in the ratios of the nutrients can often lead to noxious and harmful algal bloom including those that have um, toxins, that produce toxins. Um, one very common or very uh, parallel thing that happened this year and many other years is the cyanobacteria in Lake Erie, the toxins, the microcystins that they produce, and shutting down of the Toledo water supply for several days on end. So yes, they're very connected. One, one more, maybe? Oh, here. Okay, good. Nancy, you showed that I think in the uh, mid 70s, early 80s, there was a, an increase in nitrate, then it kind of flattened out thereafter. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions. One, what led to that flattening out? It's been stable, I think, ever since. And I guess the second half of that is you said that even for the same nitrate input, the carbon's already in the system, so you're going to see this continuing anoxia even right. though maybe the discharge stops. Right. Um, the flattening out uh, is with fertilizer use, but that graph doesn't go quite far enough because there's more fertilizer use now with the ethanol production. So that's going to push it up a little bit. Um, what was the second part? Okay. So if we were to turn off the spigot right now to the Gulf of Mexico, it might take six to eight years for there to be little, very little low oxygen. And, and we're not going to turn the spigot off. Um, there's a, a major economy that depends on what happens in the Midwest of the U.S. But a similar situation in the Black Sea, the northwest shelf of the Black Sea receives the Danube River. And the Danube River had more and more nitrogen, phosphorus, and more and more low oxygen. Collapse of the Soviet Union, no more subsidies for nitrogen, phosphorus, the nitrogen and phosphorus load fell off and the low oxygen fell off so that it's uh, almost non-existent now. The food web, the dynamics haven't recovered, but it's a good example that if you can curtail nutrients, then you can make a difference. But I'm not advocating ec economic collapse um, for the United States.